Welcome back to Serafina and the Black Cloak by Robert Beatty. Today we're moving into Chapter 8. Hey Renegades! We are back with Chapter 8 and I'm super excited to see where this all goes because if you were watching for Chapter 7, you know some crazy stuff is going down. So we are going to get right into it and start off with chapter 8 of Serafina and the Black Cloak. Here we go. The axe is gone, Serafina said, as she and Brayden searched the area around the carriage. Without the axe or anyone to help them move the trees, they couldn't clear the road in front of them or behind them. They were trapped. We can ride the horses, Brayden suggested, but the trees grew so closely together in this part of the forest that the horses couldn't pass between them, which was almost a relief to Serafina because she couldn't imagine clawing her way up onto the back of one of those stompers and expecting it not to kill her. We can walk, she said. Eleven miles is a long way to walk in these woods, he said, especially at night. He kept looking around, obviously frustrated, and she was too, but there was something she liked about the fact that they were in this together. He was thinking of her as an ally. She'd never spent much time with other people, but she was beginning to see why people liked it. Although she was pretty sure that not everyone was as clever and kind as Brayden Vanderbilt. If we stay here, we can, we can use the carriage for shelter, he said. My uncle sent a rider ahead to tell the Vances that I was on my way. When I don't arrive, they'll come looking for me. I'm sure of it. I think we should wait for help. She didn't want to argue. She wanted to keep moving, but she knew he was probably right. She kept hearing the words he'd said to the horses. We're in this together. We're going to be all right. The words felt strangely reassuring to her as well. She watched as Brayden unharnessed the horses for the night. The horses couldn't go far because of the fallen trees blocking the road, but at least they could move around. He gave them hay and water from the supply that Nolan had stowed in the back of the carriage. Prior to this, she had only seen horses from a distance, and they had always seemed like terribly wild and unpredictable beasts. But as she watched Brayden working with them, talking to them and caring for them, they seemed to be such good-hearted creatures far more intelligent than she realized. Horses usually sleep standing up, Brayden said, and they always take shifts, so at least one of them is awake and alert for danger. If they sense something, they'll raise the alarm. You just have to know the signals. Excellent, we have watch horses, she said with a smile, trying to cheer him up. Brayden smiled in return, but she could see he was still very frightened by what had happened and she was too. When a gust of wind passed through the trees, she reflexively spun around, fearing that the flying specter had returned. What do you see? Brayden asked. Nothing, she said. It's just the wind. The night's cold had settled onto the forest, and with the moonlight that filtered down through the trees, they could see their breath. When a screech owl gave an eerie trill in the distance, it startled Brayden, but the sound of the bird calmed Serafina. She had lived all her life hearing those sorts of sounds on her nightly prowls of Biltmore's grounds. Just an owl, Brayden said as he exhaled. Just an owl. As they climbed into the carriage, Brayden held the door open for her and helped her up the little steps, touching her back with his hand. It was as if they were entering the grand ballroom for the holiday dance. As a young gentleman, it was a natural gesture for him. Probably just a habit, but it was a sensation she had never felt before. For a moment, that gentle touch of Brayden's hand against her back was all she could feel or think about. It was the first time in her life that anyone other than her pa had touched her in a kind and gentle way. She tried hard to tell herself that Brayden's touch probably meant a lot more to her than it did to him. He probably wasn't even aware that he touched her. She knew that he had danced and dined with many fancy dressed girls. It was probably silly for her to think that he wanted to be friends with a girl 
who wore a shirt for a dress and couldn't ride a horse. Come on, Braden said quietly to Gideon, and the dog hopped up into the carriage with them. Braden shut and locked the wooden door and shook it a few times to make sure that it was secure. Gideon circled twice, then took his position on the floor, guarding the door. I'm sorry there aren't any blankets, Braden said, looking through the carriage's storage cabinets and trying to figure out how they're going to stay warm. Not even a good cloak to sleep under. I'll pass on the cloak, thank you, Serafina said with a smile. And Braden laughed a little, but he seemed almost as nervous as she was to be crammed inside the carriage together with nothing to do but look at each other in the darkness. Braden sat down and patted the seat next to him. Perhaps you should sit here, Serafina, on this side. We've got to stay warm somehow. Despite the uncomfortable tightness forming in her chest, she slowly moved toward him. She hoped she didn't smell like the basement. If he was accustomed to ladies like Anastasia Rostanova with her lavish dresses, or even Miss Whitney with her rose-scented perfume, she couldn't imagine that her own scent would be too pleasant for him. Excuse me, Miss Serafina, he would say, gagging and coughing. On second thought, perhaps you should indeed sleep on the floor with the dog. But he didn't say that. She sat beside him, and the world didn't come to an end. As they snuggled together a little to stay warm, she fretted that he'd discover some bizarre characteristic about her that she didn't even realize was bizarre. She just hoped there wouldn't be a reason for her to take off her shoes in Braden's presence and have him notice her missing toes. She didn't want him to get too close. Would he be able to feel her missing bones? She wasn't even sure which ones they were. How many bones did a person usually have anyway? She had always been content to snuggle into small places on her own, but she was surprised to find herself so comfortable cuddled up beside him. She was able to relax a little and breathe again. Earlier that morning, when she'd woken up wedged in a metal drying rack in Biltmore's basement, the last place in the world she would have thought she'd spend her next evening was nestled in the velvet warmth between the Vanderbilt boy and his valiant guard dog. Gideon, for his part, seemed to have gotten over his initial reaction to her. They'd fought together on the same side, she and this dog, and maybe they were a little bit friends now, at least temporarily. Serafina, I need to ask you a question, Braden said in the darkness. All right, she agreed, but she knew it wasn't going to be good. Why do you live in the basement? She didn't know if he considered her to be his friend or if they were just shoved together by happenstance, and he was making the best out of a bad situation. But after all they'd been through together, it didn't seem right to lie to him, and she didn't want to. I'm the machine mechanic's daughter, she said finally. She just said it, just like that, out loud. Even as she said the words, she felt both pride and a sickening feeling of impending doom that she had betrayed her father. I've always liked him, Brayden said casually. He fixed the buckle on my saddle and made it much more comfortable for my horse. He likes you too, she said although she remembered that her pa had spoken more about the buckle that, boy, that day than the boy. So, have you been down there in the basement all this time? Brayden asked in amazement. I'm good at staying out of the way, she said simply. She wanted to tell him that she was the chief rat catcher, but she held her tongue, not sure how he would react to the thought of her grabbing rats. He might want to know when she had last washed her hands. She suddenly doubted if he even cared what she did. All sorts of rich and famous people and their children came to Billmore. So why would Brayden care what she did all night? So you were down there in the basement when you saw the man in the black cloak the first time? He said, who do you think it is? I don't know, she said. I don't even know if he's a human or a haint. What's a haint? Braden asked, his eyebrows raised. A shade, a haunt, you know, a ghost. The man in the black cloak may be some sort of wraith that comes out of the woods at night, but I think he's a mortal man. I think he's one of the gentlemen at Biltmore. 
And what makes you think that? Braden said in surprise. His satin cloak, his shoes, the way he walks, the way he talks. There's something about him, like he thinks he's better than everyone else. Well, he's currently scarier than anyone I've met, Braden said, but then said no more. She could tell that her theory that the man in the black cloak was a gentleman at Biltmore had disturbed him. They sat in silence for a long time. She could feel Brayden's warmth beside her, his breathing and the beating of his heart. She could smell the faint scent of wool, leather, and horses on him. Regardless of what the two of them being in the carriage together might or might not really mean, for the moment, it brought her a wonderful sense of peace, a sense that she belonged, and that despite everything that was going on, she was exactly where she was meant to be. It didn't make any sense to her or even seem possible but there was no denying that that was how she felt. I need to ask you to do me a favor, she said quietly. All right, he said. Please don't tell anyone about me and my father. He really needs his job. He loves Biltmore. Braden nodded his head. I understand. I won't tell anyone, I swear. Thank you, she said, relieved. It felt like she could trust Brayden, and his reputation among the kitchen staff for being a loner who preferred to spend time with his animal friends rather than human beings seemed totally unfair to her now. As Brayden fell asleep, his breathing became slow and steady. Remaining very still, Seraphina turned to gaze upon him. She passed her eyes over his smooth, pale complexion. He was so clean and his clothing fits so well. His woolen jacket must have been made just for him. Even the buttons had been wrought with his very own initials, BV, etched upon every one. Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt must have commissioned those buttons, she thought. Did that mean they loved and cherished Brayden? Or was it just so that he would fit into their elegant society? Her pa had told her the story of Mr. Vanderbilt, while they were washing up after supper one night in the workshop. Like many well-off gentlemen in society, George Vanderbilt used his inheritance to build a home. But he didn't build it in New York City like all the others. He built it in the remote wilds of western North Carolina, set deep in the densely forested mountains miles and miles from the nearest town. The ladies and gentlemen of elite New York society thought this was extremely eccentric behavior. Why would such a highly educated man, born and raised in the civilized luxury of New York City, want to live in the wilderness of such a dark and forested place? Biltmore Estate took years to build, but when it was finally finished and everyone saw what George Vanderbilt had done, they understood his dream. He had constructed the largest, most magnificent home in America, surrounded by a working, self-sustaining estate and the gentle beauty of the Blue Ridge Mountains. He married a few years later, and everyone who was fortunate enough to earn an invitation came to the city of Asheville to visit George and Edith Vanderbilt. They were the rich, the famous, and the powerful, senators, governors, great industrialists, leaders of foreign countries, favored musicians, talented writers, artists, and intellectuals of all kinds. It was beneath this glittering world that her pa had raised her. She looked at Braden and she remembered when he came to Biltmore two years before. The servants spoke of the tragedy in hushed tones. Mr. Vanderbilt's 10 year old nephew was coming to live at Biltmore because his family had died in a house fire in New York. No one knew how it started, perhaps an oil lamp or a spark from the cook fire in the kitchen, but the house caught on fire in the middle of the night. Gideon woke Brayden in a smoke-filled bedroom, pulled at his arm with his teeth, and dragged him from his bed. With the walls and ceiling ablaze around them, they stumbled out of the burning house, choking and exhausted. They barely escaped with their lives. Gideon had saved him. It was only then that Brayden discovered that his mother, father, brothers, and sisters were all dead. His entire family had been consumed by the fire. It made Serafina shudder to think about it. She couldn't stand the thought of losing her pa. 
How sad and lost Brayden must have felt to lose his whole family. She had heard the servants talk about how hundreds of ladies and gentlemen, servants and folk of every ilk came out for the funeral. Four black horses pulled the carriage stacked with eight coffins as a little boy walked alongside holding his uncle's hand. She remembered watching the boy the day he arrived at, the, at Biltmore and wondering about him. The servant said he came with no luggage, no belongings whatsoever, other than the four black horses, which his uncle agreed to ship by train from New York. Moving closer to Brayden, she remembered what he'd said to her earlier that night. These horses and I have been friends for a long time. From that day forward, she had kept a lookout for the boy. She often saw him walking the grounds in the morning. He spent long periods of time watching the birds in the trees. He fished for trout in the streams, but much to the consternation of the cook, he always released whatever he caught. When she watched him in the house, he didn't seem comfortable around boys and girls his own age, or most of the adults either. He loved his dog and his horses, but that was all. Those seemed to be his only friends. She remembered overhearing his aunt speaking to a guest once. He's just going through a phase, Mrs. Vanderbilt had said, trying to explain why he was so quiet at the dining table and so shy at parties. He'll snap out of it. But Serafina had a feeling that he never did. His aunt and uncle lived in a world of extravagant parties, but from a distance, Braden seemed to find more accomplishment in riding a horse or repairing the wing of a wounded hawk than dancing with the girls at the resplendent proms. She remembered prowling around outside the windows of the winter garden when it was all lit up for a ball one summer's eve. She watched the girls in their lovely gowns sashaying this way and that, dancing with the boys and drinking sparkling punch from a giant fountain in the center of the room. She always wanted to be one of those girls in a fancy dress and shiny shoes. She remembered listening to the orchestra play and the people talking and laughing. Crouched down in the shadow beneath the windows, she could look over and see the silent gaze of the stone lions guarding the front doors of the house. She didn't know how Brayden felt about her, but there was one thing for sure. She was different different from any girl he had seen before. She had no idea whether that fixed her as a friend or enemy, but it was something. It was the middle of the night now, and she knew that she should sleep, but she wasn't tired. The day hadn't left her exhausted. It had exhilarated her. Suddenly, the entire world was different than it had been the day before. She'd never felt so alive in her life. There were so many questions, so many mysteries to solve. She kept praying that somehow, some way, despite everything she had seen, Clara, Nolan, and Anastasia were still alive, and she could save them. She wanted to go outside and hunt through the woods in search of clues about the man in the black cloak. But she decided to stay where she was, content to remain curled up beside Brady. After a while, it began to rain a heavy rain, and she listened to the sound of it on the leaves of the trees and the roof of the carriage and she thought it was a perfect sound. Her eyes and ears open. She vowed that if the man in the black cloak came again that night, she'd be ready. And that is the end of chapter eight. They are still in the carriage, and I guess we'll find out what happens next. So stay tuned for chapter nine, my friends, and I'll see you later, Renegades. Hey Renegades, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of Serafina's adventure as we move through Serafina and the Black Cloak. See you later Renegades!